Well, it's time for us to do some practice with problems which involve using the first derivative. So in other words, understanding when functions are increasing and decreasing, as well as being able to classify critical points. As always, it's important that you do the practice because, you know, me doing these problems helps me. It's when you do the problems that it helps you. So do as much as you can on your own. And if you want to follow along with the videos, go ahead and make frequent use of that pause button and do the prompt and go as far as you can until you get stuck. Then you can unpause, watch along. And then once you say, aha, here's how I continue, pause it again and keep going. Because the more that you do, the better you're going to become. And I believe in you. You're going to become wonderful. All right. Well, let's begin. The first prompt, determine the intervals when the curve y equals x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x plus 17 is increasing and decreasing. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there's one interval where it's both increasing and decreasing because you can't do the same, those two things at the same time. You can't be going up and be going down simultaneously. What it means is we're going to split our domain up into intervals and say which ones are places where the function is increasing and which ones are places where the function is decreasing. So when we're talking about increasing, decreasing, we always think to ourselves, first derivative. So first derivative is where we get our information. So we start by saying, okay, what is our first derivative? So that'd be 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. Now we say, all right, that's our first derivative. We need to figure out when is this positive, when is this negative? Because that's going to give us our information that we need. So to do that, we want to say, okay, how do we figure out where the critical points are? Because that's where we might change behavior from one form to another. Which means, we ask, is this derivative ever undefined? Nope, good to go. Okay, is it equal to zero? Probably, otherwise it may not be a very interesting question. And when we see polynomial, we say, okay, that means factor. So, hmm, let's see, we could factor out a three. So that would become x squared minus 2x minus 3. And now we say, well, is there a way to factor x squared minus 2x minus 3? We would need to find two numbers that multiply together to give negative 3, but add to give us negative 2. I think I know two numbers that do that. Negative 3 and 1 do that. So let's try that. So x minus 3 and x plus 1. Now let's double check. Okay, so that would be x squared, good, plus x minus 3x, that's minus 2x, good, and minus 3. Okay, yeah, so that, that's right. Now, we're after our critical points, and so we're going to ask ourselves a question, when does this equal 0? See, that's why we're factoring, is because we're getting to the point when answering the question, when does this equal 0, is pretty straightforward. You see, when I have a product of things equal to 0, I just have to say, when does each little piece equal 0? So I can say, well, x minus 3 would be 0. This happens at x equals 3. x plus 1 equals 0. That happens at x equals minus 1. Now, we're in the situation where we know where our critical points are, which means we can draw our line. So here's our line. And now we're going to mark our points. They're at 3 and negative 1. Really don't have to worry about much, just have to make sure we take it in the right order. Because remember, there is an orientation here. We go, you know, left to right, negative to positive. So we just have to make sure we get our numbers in the right order, negative one, positive three. All right, good. So what comes next? Well, what comes next is we now have to test each interval. So how do we test? Well, we pick points. And uh, so, for instance, our first interval, all numbers below negative 1. So I can pick any number below negative 1. But I don't want to pick any number. I don't want to pick like negative, you know, pi squared. I want to pick numbers which are easy to work with computationally. In other words, things which won't give me a hard time. So I could pick, for example, negative 2. So let's suppose we plug in negative 2. All right. Now, you can plug it in any, any one of these forms. I like to plug it into this last form because I can just say, okay, what happens? Negative 2 minus 3 is a negative value. Negative 2 plus 1 is also a negative value. 
So then I have a positive, a negative, and a negative. And if I multiply all those together, I end up getting a positive. Now, I now have checked what's the derivative at negative 2. And I saw it was positive. Notice I didn't care about the value, because I'm after increasing, decreasing. What that allows us to say is not just at negative 2, but at all of these points, our derivative is positive. All right, now, next interval, negative 1 to 3. All right, I see a good candidate there, 0. 0 is your friend. As often as you can, use 0. So I'll plug 0. I'll plug it into the first form. See that? You can just spot right away. 0, 0, minus 9. It's negative. Not if, you don't even have to do anything. So that says f prime of 0 is negative. Yeah, it's negative 9. But again, the 9 is not important. It's the negative that's important. So that tells us that for this whole interval here, the derivative is negative. All right, now, pick a number bigger than 3. 4, that's bigger than 3. All right, so what can we say about f prime of 4? I'll go back to this version. We get 3, 4 minus 3, 1, positive. 4 plus 1, 5, positive. So, third of that 4 is positive, which means that the derivative in this interval is positive. So we see, aha, we get switching behavior. I positive meaning increasing, negative meaning decreasing, positive meaning back to increasing. Now, what was our goal? Our goal was the intervals. So what are our intervals? Well, let's uh, see. We have our increasing intervals, and then we're going to have our decreasing interval. All right. So for increasing, we're increasing up to negative 1. So we can write that as negative infinity less than x. And I like to include negative 1. All right. How about decreasing? That's our next one, negative 1 to 3. So negative 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 3. And how about after 3? Well, we're back to having derivative positive, which means we're back to increasing, which means 3 less than or equal to x less than infinity. Now, if you look at this, you might say, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that you said here we're increasing at 3 and we're also decreasing at 3. How can I be both increasing and decreasing at a point? And the answer is you can't. You cannot be increasing and decreasing at a point. The question is what's happening in intervals. Increasing and decreasing is about intervals because you have to make comparisons. And so essentially what you see here is that we have one type of behavior to the interval to the left of 3. So in other words, it's decreasing to the left of 3. And another type of behavior to the right of 3. So I can include 3 in both intervals because in that interval, as I include 3, I do satisfy the definitions of being increasing or decreasing. It actually tells us a little bit about what 3 is. The question doesn't ask us this, but we can spot. See here, we're going down and going up, which says 3 is a min. Here, at negative 1, we're going up and going down, which says negative 1 is a max. All right. Well, that would be a different type of problem. I suspect it's the type of problem we'll see sooner or later. All right, the next question. Find the largest intervals for which the function g of t is t to the fifth plus 5t to the fourth minus 20t cubed minus 31 is increasing and for which it is decreasing. Okay, so it's interesting that they specify the word largest. I'd, well, we'll figure out what that means when we get into the problem a little bit. All right, so let's just do our behavior. What do we do? We're after our derivative because that's what's going to tell us increasing, decreasing. So we say, all right, let's start with our first derivative. And by the way, we should point out that there haven't been any restrictions placed on our domain. And when there are no restrictions placed on your domain, it's the largest possible domain, in this case, all of the numbers. So, because polynomials are nice. You can plug in anything into a polynomial. Yep. Polynomials, they're the type of functions you like to take home to meet your family. Because, you know, they're just so pleasant. They'll win your family over in no time. All right, so there's our derivative. 
5t to the fourth plus 20t cubed minus 60t squared. Because we're we're getting good at taking derivatives of polynomials. Wouldn't it be nice if everything were a polynomial? Well, it would be very nice. Well, we'll get to that in Calc 2. Beautiful topic. All right. Now, similar process. We want to say, okay, let's figure out what's happening. Well, it's never undefined. So we need to figure out where it's zero, which means it's time to factor. Now we see they're all multiples of five for the coefficients. They also have powers of t. So let's pull out a five t squared. And if we do that, what are we left with? Well, a t squared, then here it'll be a, a four t, not to be confused with 40, that's four t, and then minus a 12, and that's it, all right. So what are we looking for? Well, we want two numbers that multiply together to give negative 12, but add together to give four. I think we can come up with two numbers that do that. So uh, how about six and negative two, does that work? I think so. Let's try it. t plus six and t minus two. So let's see, that'd be t squared minus two t plus 60, that's four t, good. And minus, four. yeah, it worked, woohoo, yeah. All right. And now, of course, we have it in a nice factored form. And so we look at this and say, when does this equal zero? Well, we have a couple of things. We have the t squared. Well, that would equal zero at zero. The t plus six, well, that would be at negative six. The t minus two would be at positive two. Now you might say, hey, what about that five? No, 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 five is never zero. Five is five. All right. So. There are three critical points here. So we should draw our line. So here we go. Here's our line. So we just gotta make sure we get the points in the right order. So we have uh, negative six, zero, and two would be the right order. So negative six and zero and two. You don't have to worry about the space. You don't have to be like, well, this interval from negative six to zero has to be exactly three times. As no, 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 no. But that's not important. We just need to sort of see how do we chop it up. So we see that we're breaking things up into four pieces, which means we get to test at four locations to understand the behavior. All right, now let's uh, test each interval. So suppose we want to test below negative six. All right, so, so pick a value. Well, negative seven. All right, so you have five, positive, negative seven, squared, positive, negative seven plus six is negative, negative seven minus two is negative. So positive, positive, negative, negative means that we're gonna have our derivative is positive. So we're positive below negative six. Okay, between negative six and zero? Well, hmm, negative one, that sounds pretty good. So if we plug in negative one, what do we see? Well, we'll see a uh, positive from the first piece, the 5t squared. Negative 1 plus 6 is positive. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative. So positive, positive, negative. Put it together. The result is a negative value. So our derivative is negative. All right. How about between 0 and 2? Well, pick 1. Uh, 5 times 1 squared, that's positive. 1 plus 6, positive. 1 minus 2, negative. So it's still positive, positive, negative. And so we still change, sorry, we're still negative. All right, above two, now you're like, ha ha, pi, no, 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 three, something easy to compute. Remember, we, we love ourselves. We love ourselves so much, we're gonna give ourselves something which is easy to compute. All right, so, uh, like three. Okay, so positive, 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 right? So. We're back to having the derivative being positive, which we know means our derivative is increasing. Now, our goal was the largest intervals. You'll notice something here about these two intervals. They are both have negative sign, which means that we're both decreasing. We're decreasing and then we're decreasing again, which means we don't have to think of negative six to zero as one place and zero to two as one place. We can think of it as just all the way from negative six to two, because at zero we are continuous, so we can you know, bridge the gap, so to speak. So 
what do we have? Well, we can say the first interval, and uh, we'll go ahead and change our notation just so we can see all the sort of different types of notations you might see. So negative infinity comma up to negative six. That's we're going to be increasing. All right, and then from negative six comma to whoops positive two. Ha ha ha. We are decreasing. And then from positive to all the way out to infinity. We are back to increasing. I will say we don't include infinity because infinity is not a number. You can't include it because it's not a number. So it's more of a concept. It just says very, very large, arbitrarily large. All right, so there you go. There's our answer. Nice. Good. Good. I should, we should put a box on that one. All right. Well, on to another problem. Ha! Who would have guessed? Well, I suspect we all would have guessed that. Okay. Now, our next problem. Find the two critical... Okay, so now we know there's two of them. Two critical points of y equals x to the power two-thirds, e to the minus 2x over 3, and use the first derivative test for each point to determine if they are a local min, local max, or neither. Okay, so now we're after classifying critical points. So, well, first thing is, if we're going to classify critical points, we should find critical points. So let's take a look. Uh, well, critical points come from our derivative, so we'll start there. So we're going to start, we have our derivative. Uh, we have a product of two functions, the x to the two-thirds, the e to the minus 2x over 3. So I'm going to use a product rule. So take the derivative of the first, the two-thirds, x to the minus one-third, and then the second, leave it alone, and then add to that the first, x to two-thirds, times the derivative of the second. Well, this is e to something, and the way we take the derivative of e to something is it's e to that something, times the derivative of the inside. And if you take the derivative of minus 2x over 3, well, it's really minus 2 thirds times x. So that's a constant times x. So that would be negative 2 thirds. All right. Well, hmm, there's a lot going for this. Yes, we do have two terms, but they're very close to each other. In other words, there's a lot that we can pull out, we can factor out. So let's see what we can factor out. They both have a 2 thirds. That's good. So we'll factor that out. They both have powers of x. So when they both have powers of x, the rule is factor out the lower power. Well, between negative one-third and two-thirds, negative one-third is the lower one, so we'll factor that out. So x to the negative one-third. Then they both have e to the minus two x over three, so we'll factor that out as well. And if we do all of that, what do we get? Well, from the first term, we've gotten everything. So that's one. From the last term, we didn't get that minus, so there's a minus, and then the power here. Well, the power will be two-thirds minus minus a third, which means it'll be to the one. So one minus x. All right, there we go. So there's our derivative. Now, where are the critical points? Well, we go through, when it's factored like this, it's actually, it says, look at each point, excuse me, each term, one by one, and see what happens. Now, the two-thirds, we don't have to worry about. That's the constant. x to the negative one-third. Well, here, because it's a negative exponent, it really means we're dividing by something. It's like one over the cubed root of x. That could be a problem if we're dividing by something that's zero. So, x equals zero is going to be a critical point. It's because the derivative will be undefined there. It's not undefined in the original function. So if you plug zero into the original function, You'll have 0 to a positive exponent, and that's okay. It's the undefining the derivative. Oftentimes, that's an indication that you have probably like a vertical tangent line going on. The e to the minus 2x over 3. Now, this is a really useful thing to know about the exponential function. What's true about the exponential function? It's always positive. So, no matter what I plug in, I'm always going to get a positive value out. So I don't need to worry about when that equals 0 or when it's undefined. 1 minus x being 0, well, that happens at x equals 1. 
So now we say, aha, there are our two critical points. Zero and one, watch good. We're good, we got two and only two because the problem asked us about two critical points. So the next thing is to draw a line. So there we are, there's our line. And now we're gonna mark zero and one. All right, so now we start plugging in points. So what's something below zero? Well, negative one. All right, well, now what do we have to do? We have to determine the sign. Let's use certain things for advantage. We know that the exponential will always be positive. The two thirds is always positive. So it really comes down to the two places, x to the minus one third and one minus x. This looks like a cubed root of a negative number. It just happens to be downstairs. Cubed root of a negative is negative. So I'll be negative. So when I plug negative one into here, I'll get a negative value from there. One subtract a negative value is positive. So I can conclude that the derivative at negative one is going to be a negative value. All right, so I really conclude that it's negative for everywhere below zero. That's what the real conclusion is. All right, between zero and one, pick a half. A half to negative one third is positive. One minus a half is positive. So that says our derivative at a half is positive. Remember, these other two pieces are always positive, so we're good to go. So we're really positive between zero and one. In other words, our function is going to go uphill. We're going up from zero to one. All right, pick a number bigger than one, let's say two. Two to the negative one third is positive, one minus two is negative. Put that together, and we see that our derivative at two is negative. So that our derivative is always negative below, sorry, above one. All right, good. Now, what were we after? Well, we found the two critical points, and we actually said, hey, things are increasing, decreasing. You now you might want to say, hey, well, we, we weren't after increasing, decreasing, we were after the first derivative test. But actually the first derivative test is about increasing, decreasing, because the question is, what happens on either side? So in the process of, of doing the first derivative test, we're gonna naturally find out where functions are increasing and decreasing. So we say what's happening at zero, we are decreasing to the left, which means we're going downhill below zero, and we're increasing to the right, which means we're going uphill above zero. So at zero, we come down and then go up. Well, what does that tell us about zero? So it tells us that zero is a local min, right? Going down and up, you can even see it. It's sort of a nice little valley there. Now at one, we're going up to the left of zero, we're going down to the right of zero. So we're going up and then down. So what can we say about one? So one is a local max. And that's what we want. See, we found the two critical points. We'll even say x equals x equals, just to be clear that these are the inputs and we use the first derivative test to determine that at zero, we have a local min, and at one, we have a local max. All right, good. All right, our next problem. So, suppose our function is 6x plus 6 divided by x squared plus three, and we have the interval, negative five to positive three. Okay, so in other words, even though this function is defined everywhere, you notice that x squared plus three, that may make you like, but x squared plus three is always positive. So it is defined for all x, but we're gonna say, narrow your focus just to the interval from negative five to three. All right, so there's two parts, part A determine the intervals for which the function is increasing and which it is decreasing. And again, I only have to focus on what's happening between negative five and three. And then part B says for each critical point and endpoint, just to be clear, I, I will tell you some textbooks, they waver on whether an endpoint is a critical point, but 
just to be clear, we are going to absolutely include endpoints in this problem. We're going to classify each one of them as, as either an, an absolute max, absolute min, a local max, a local min, and neither max nor min. Okay, a lot going on there. All right, so let's uh, start going. Now, the first thing, since we're after where a function is increasing and decreasing, then we really need to do the following. We need to look at the derivative. So how do you take the derivative of a function like 6x plus 6 over x squared plus 3? Well, time for a quotient rule. Okay, so f prime of x. We're going to take the bottom, x squared plus 3, times root of the top, 6, minus the top, 6x plus 6, times root of the bottom, which is 2x. And all of that is going to be divided by the bottom term squared. Now, the nice thing is that the bottom term squared is not going to be too important when it comes to figuring out the sign because it's going to be always be a positive. In our case, it's always defined. It's really going to be the upstairs where we're going to focus most of our energy. So that'll be upstairs, 6x squared plus 18. And then here, if you multiply this out, you'll have, don't forget the minus goes through to both terms. So 2x times 6x is minus 12x squared. And then you have a minus 6 times 2x is minus 12x. All of that divided by x squared plus 3 squared. All right, good. Well, keep going. So that'll be minus 6x squared minus 12x plus 18 divided by x squared plus 3 squared. And you can factor out a negative 6. x squared plus 2x minus 3 divided by x squared plus 3 squared. And then, well, can you factor x squared plus 2x minus 3? Well, we need two things that multiply together to give negative 3 and add together to give positive 2. Like 3 and negative 1 do that. So negative 6 times x plus 3, x minus 1, and divide that by x squared plus 3 squared. All right, good, good. Now, we can, you should always check, you know, x squared minus x plus 3x is plus 2x and minus 3. What's the next thing we do? The derivative is never undefined. So the critical points come from when we set the derivative equal to 0. And so if we now set this equal to 0, we can say, hey, we don't need to worry about the denominator. That doesn't cause the zeros. It's the numerators. And so when does the numerator equal 0? That will happen when either x plus 3 equals 0 or x minus 1 equals 0. So we see, aha, we get two critical points, negative 3 and positive 1. OK, now what happens next? Well, we're going to draw our line. But it's not an unbounded infinite line because we actually have endpoints. So we say, all right, so we're going to have four points on this line. Now we have the endpoints at negative 5 and positive 3. And then we have negative 3 and positive 1. Now, if we had gone points, say, you know, something like 18 as one of our critical points, well, we would say, look, we don't need to worry about 18. It's outside of our interval. But it turns out that both negative 3 and positive 1 are points which are in our interval. So we are going to include them. So here's negative 3, and here's positive 1. All right. So those are our critical points, which means that when it comes to figuring out whether things are increasing or decreasing, that's where we need to be looking. All right. Well, let's uh, get to it. So we need to test each one of these three intervals. So we're trying to figure out whether things are increasing, decreasing. So let's uh, go ahead. Now, between negative 5 and negative 3, by the way, I could plug in negative 5. Because negative 5 is not a critical point of the derivative. It's where the, the function uh, just has the domain end. 
So if you wanted to plug in negative 5, you could, but just to be comfortable, we'll plug in negative 4 because people won't argue with me if I plug in negative 4. Now, when we plug it in, the denominator is always positive. We have a negative. This will be a negative, and that'll be a negative because it'll be negative 1, that'll be negative 5. Negative, negative, negative means that between negative 5 and negative 3, our derivative is negative. Now, how about between negative 3 and 1? I think we all know where we're going with that one. 0. Okay, negative, positive, negative. So, if we put them all together, negative, positive, negative, that gets us to a positive. All right. We could also have seen if we plugged in 0 over here. But, now back to our regularly scheduled problem. Let's say 2. Then we have a negative, positive, and a positive. Put that together, and we get a negative. Okay, so what do we have? Well, what we have is the following. We know the behavior of our, our function, roughly speaking. It's going to be going down, and then it's going to be going up, and then it's going to be going down. All right, so we can actually say a couple of things right away. We can say, for instance, that negative 3 is a local min, because I'm coming down and up. 1 is a local max, but we can say even more. We can talk about our endpoints. What can we say about negative 5? It will be a local max. Why? Because it's bigger than everything nearby. Because I'm not looking to the left of negative 5. I only, when I talk about nearby, I can only go in one direction, and that's to the right. And therefore, since it's, you know, it, I'm coming down off of negative 5 as I move from left to right, then it's going to be a local max. Similarly, at 3, I'll be a local min. So, now, I can, I can classify where all the local maxes and local mins are. So, local max, local min, local max, local min. But I also have to be careful because, remember, there was this extra word thrown in. It's possible that some of those will be an absolute max, an absolute min. Now, here's the good news. If I am an absolute max, or that's sometimes called the global max, I'm also a local max. And similarly, if I'm an absolute min, I'm also a local min. So what I need to do is figure out what's the behavior of the function at these points. So we go back to our, our old making a list type idea. We're making a list and we're checking it twice. All right. So oh, we should pause and, and write down the answer for part A. Okay, so for part A, our answer is we are decreasing... For which intervals? Well, from negative 5 up to negative 3, and 1 up to 3. And then we are increasing, and that will be for the interval from negative 3 up to 1. I, I will say, depending upon who you learn calculus from, these may be open intervals, and I'm okay with that. I still love people who put open intervals there. I just feel like they should be closed. Okay. All right, now, back to our, our absolute max, absolute min. We need to figure out what's happening with the values of these functions. So, hmm, let's uh, evaluate. So I need to figure out what happens at negative 5, what happens at negative 3, and I'm plugging it into the original function, not into the derivative, because I, I care about the outputs. So, hopefully these are going to be nice numbers. Fingers crossed. So, let's see what happens. Negative 5 times 6 is negative 30, plus 6 is negative 24, and then I have 25 plus 3, which is 28. So that would be negative 24 28ths. It's a strange number, but, you know, it has to be a number. Uh, how about negative 3? That would be negative 18 plus 6, so that would be negative 12. Downstairs would be 9 
plus 3, which is 12. Oh, negative 12 over positive 12. That would make that a negative 1. That's a little bit more palatable as numbers go. Okay, how about at 1? We'll get 6 plus 6, which is 12, over 1 plus 3, which is 4. So 12 fourths, also known as 3. And how about at 3? You'll get 18 plus 6, which is 24. And downstairs, you're going to get uh, 9 plus 3, which is 12. So you get 24 twelfths, which is known as 2. Oh, hey, actually, these numbers turned out really well. I think somebody likes us. They really, really like, like us. So they gave us numbers that we can work with pretty well. Now, where is the absolute max? And where's the local max? Well, really, our absolute max is either at negative 5 and 1, because those are our local maxes. And we can spot 1 is definitely much higher. So, so 1, this is our, our absolute max. And then, of course, the question is, where's our min? Well, it's either going to happen at negative 3 or a positive 3. Because those were our local mins. I say, well, between negative 1 and 2, definitely negative 1. That's smaller, so that's our absolute min. And now we say, okay, now we're ready to do part B. So for part B, we have the following. So we have that x equals negative 5 is a local max. x equals negative 3 is a absolute min x equals 1 is an absolute max and x equals 3 is a local min. Now it is possible that you know, various things could have happened. If we had had ties, it is possible we can achieve an absolute max at multiple locations. That's perfectly fine. It is possible that some of our critical points would be neither an absolute min or a max, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but that didn't happen here. So anyways, the real justification came from understanding what's the behavior on these intervals combined with saying what's the value of the function. So put those pieces of information together and we can identify mins and maxes, absolute and local. All right, well, one more problem. All right. Find and classify the critical points of the function e to the x Divide by 4x squared plus 3. All right, good. Well, so find and classify. Well, the only way we have to classify is the first derivative test. So we know where we're going. We definitely need to, to have the first derivative to use the first derivative test. But we also have to have the first derivative in order to find them. Starting off, what's the domain of our function? And the answer is all numbers. Because you can plug anything into there. There's no problems. There's no places where this is undefined. Life is good. All right. So you might say, wait, what about the 4x squared plus 3? Well, that's always positive. So all right. Yeah, so life is really good here. So first thing is, let's take our derivative. So ah, another quotient rule. Wow. You know, for someone who is kind of not super enthusiastic about the quotient rule, which is me, I'm not super enthusiastic about quotient rule. I seem to have a lot of problems that involve quotient rule. Well, you have to have something that makes life a little more interesting, right? Okay, so here we go. So we're going to do the following. So we're going to take uh, the bottom, 4x squared plus 3, times the derivative of the top, e to the x, minus the top, e to the x, times the derivative of the bottom, which is 8x. Good all divided by the bottom term squared. Sometimes the e to the x shows the opposite. Like, wait, was that the derivative or was that the function? So here it's the derivative and there it's the function. All right, now let's uh, first off note you can factor an e to the x out of the top. So e to the x, and then you have 4x squared plus 3 minus 8x. Now I can write that as 4x squared minus 8x plus 3. And then divide that by 
4x squared plus 3 quantity squared. All right, good. Now, what would be nice? Well, the derivative is never undefined. So we're focusing where the derivative is 0. And we don't have to worry about the denominator. We don't have to worry about e to the x, because e to the x is never 0. So we really just have that polynomial upstairs. So when we have a polynomial, what would be nice is if it factored. Is it nice? Well, hmm, let's think about that. Let's think about that. See, part of it is that 4. We don't often do polynomials where that lean coefficient is not 1. So, so we don't want to rush into it. We have to sort of take our time, savor it. But I am highly suspicious that uh, it would have given us something that factors. So let's suppose it does factor. So we're going to write it down like it is going to factor here. And let's sort of ponder this for a second. Now, uh, what do we have? Well, the fact that this is positive and that's positive and that that's negative means that we have a minus in the middle. So the reason I say that is we're going to have positive, positive. We'll give us positive. And here, uh, they have to be the same sign. It's what I, really what I should say. They have to be the same sign to get a positive value here and a positive value here. The fact that there's a negative means that our cross terms have to end up being negative. So it's something minus something, something minus something. Now, 3 is really good news for us because there's really only one way to write 3 as a product of two numbers, and that is as 3 and 1, which leaves us with the 4. Now, 4, there's two choices. There's 4 and 1 and 2 and 2. So we have to think about it. Well, we, we need to make sure we end up with 8x. So if we, I had like 4 and 1, well, I'd get 4 and minus 3. Well, that's minus 7. That doesn't work. Uh, if I had 1 and 4, I have minus 12 and minus 1. That's minus 13. That, that works even less. If I had 2 and 2, I'd have minus 2 minus 6. Oh, and that does work. So it is a 2 and a 2. Now, if you use the quadratic formula and got to the same point, that's perfectly fine. That's, you know, there's no shame in that. Um, but when we can factor, we should. All right, so we're now ready to talk about our critical points. We've already mentioned our derivative is never 0. And we've also mentioned that this part, e to the x, is always positive. This part downstairs is always positive which really leaves us with two pieces. There's the 2x minus 3 and the 2x minus 1. Now from 2x minus 3, we're going to get x equals 3 halves. And from 2x minus 1, we're going to get x equals 1 half. So those are our critical points, at 3 halves and at 1 half. All right, well, good. So we draw ourselves a line. And 3 halves and 1 half, well, that would mean that we have something that looks like this. Here's 1 half, and here's 3 halves. And now we have to test each one of these three intervals. Well, is there a convenient number below a half? I can think of one. 0 is very convenient. Well, when you plug 0 in, you'll get, again, is the focus on the 2x minus 3, 2x minus 1. The rest of this will always be positive. We're going to get a negative times a negative, which means it's positive. So we see, aha, our derivative is positive. Between a half and 3 halves? Well, 2 halves, also known as 1. So if we plug in 1, 2 minus 3 is negative. 2 minus 1 is positive. So negative and a positive means that we're going to end up with a negative value. And above 3 halves, you can pick 100, or you can pick 2. Just pick something easy for you to figure out. That's our goal. Pick a convenient value, something easy to figure out. So if I plug in 2, 4 minus 3 is positive, 4 minus 1 is positive, so therefore our derivative is positive. Now, we say, hey, what's happening? Well, what do we see? We see we're positive, which means we're going up. Negative means we're going down. And then we're negative, going down, and positive, going up. And so we can see 
our behavior. In particular, we say, aha, x equals 1 half is a local max, because we went up and down. And x equals 3 halves is a local min. We went down then up. And we classified all the critical points. That's all we needed to do. So good. Woohoo! We made it. All right. Keep working. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. And we'll see you again.